Well, I'm going to talk tonight also about hospitality, and I promise I didn't see Joe's script before she shared that, so if it sounds like plagiarism, it's really not. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the same themes. Um, I think for many of us, if, if you're a Christian like me, you hear the word hospitality, I tend to think of like a committee at our church. They mostly make coffee. It's not great coffee, but they're trying their best. Uh, or maybe you think of having friends over for dinner, like a really nice dinner. You went on Pinterest and found out some good recipes. Or having some guests stay in a guest room, friends from college or relatives. Like hospitality is washing the sheets and the towels. But as you heard from Joe, biblically hospitality actually goes way beyond that. Because biblical hospitality in the Greek of the New Testament is philoxenia. It is the love of strangers. Which is the etymological opposite of xenophobia. Which is the fear of strangers which I think it's fair to say is on the rise in our society today. If you don't believe me, turn on cable news for a few moments, any time in the last few days. Real hospitality, philoxenia, is countercultural. I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons that had these public service announcements about stranger danger. Right? right? Like we teach our children that strangers are scary people. And I get why we send that message to vulnerable kids, but I think sometimes even as adults, that tends to be a perspective. We are taught to think of people who are different from us, unknown to us, as a potential threat. In fact, when a lot of Americans think about strangers, refugees, immigrants, migrants, fleeing violence in Central America and making their way up through Mexico, even right now, they tend to think of a threat. Uh, that's true even within the church, and in some ways particularly within the church. In 2016, uh, there was an, a survey from Public Religion Research Institute that found that a majority of white evangelicals, which is my category of Christian, said that the arrival of new immigrants into their community presents a threat to their tr traditional American customs and values. In fact, white evangelicals were the only religious demographic of which the majority made that statement. Which to me feels a little bit ironic because as a white evangelical, uh, I would want to say that what defines evangelicalism is our commitment to the authority of Scripture, which tells us over and over again to practice hospitality. Now, I'm not going to promise you that the Bible says that all strangers are safe. I don't have a verse for that. But in Romans 12 and elsewhere, we are commanded to practice hospitality. As you heard, it's even a requirement for leadership in the church in 1 Timothy and in Titus. And while we tend to see strangers as a potential threat... Hebrews chapter 13 actually suggests it could be a blessing, that by entertaining, by welcoming strangers, we might be entertaining angels without realizing it. The thing about showing hospitality, of loving strangers, is when we do so, they don't say strangers for very long. Because real hospitality actually goes beyond welcoming the stranger. It means embracing them, making them part of us. Uh, it... In, Hebrew, or in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes that in Christ's death on the cross, it made possible for people who were of different ethnic groups, who were aliens and strangers to one another, who were hostile to one another, to be re reconciled together, to be formed into a single household, to become that we. The theologian Sun Chan Ra talks about the question we have to ask as Christians, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, which is, how do we move from simply being hospitable with the implication of seeing outsiders as welcomed, but still always guests, to being a single family. And at World Relief, where we work a lot with immigrants from various countries, we think of that process of immigrant integration, whether into a nation or, or into a church, as a process of moving from seeing people as strangers, to seeing them as neighbors, to seeing them as family. So I want to close with a, a personal story. And for about eight years, I lived in an apartment complex here in DuPage County, where almost all of my neighbors were immigrants. Uh, most of them actually had come as refugees to the United States, resettled by the U.S. State Department in, in partnership with World Relief DuPage and with lots of local churches who'd met these families at the airport. They'd fled persecution in their countries of origin and were rebuilding their lives here. But a number of years ago, my at the time girlfriend, Diana, who also lived in the same apartment complex, came over to my apartment, and she told me about this new family whom she'd just met. They're from East Africa, uh, they did not come as refugees, so they weren't met at the airport by World Relief and a team from a local church. They came on temporary visas, but they were fleeing persecution, so they were actually looking to apply for asylum, to tell the U.S. government that I'm going to be persecuted if I am sent back. 
But because they didn't go that, through that resettlement process, nobody was there to meet them. So they showed up, mom, eight months pregnant, three other children, um, really didn't know almost anyone in a one-bedroom apartment with no furniture. And Diana came over and told me about this, and she said, you know, I feel like we, we got to do something to help. We wanted to practice hospitality. So we put up a message on Facebook and asked friends from our church, hey, does anybody have some furniture they could help with? Diana was there at Central DuPage Hospital when that baby was born about a month later. And eventually their asylum application was approved, which is a small miracle in itself, and that meant the mom could get a job, could work, could pay their own rent. And as time went by, they didn't, they didn't need a lot of help anymore. They were just our friends. And more than that, they became family. Uh, their son, Christian, uh, was part of a Bible study that I got to lead with some of the kids in our neighborhood. And eventually he made the decision he wanted to be baptized. So I was there standing behind him at our church as he was baptized. And in our church tradition, when you choose to be baptized, you can select a sponsor, basically a mentor, a friend who will commit to praying for you throughout your life to uh, really spur you on to following Jesus. And so I had the privilege to be Christian's godfather. And still one of the things I'm proudest of, that I have that relationship with him. We're family. Well, after about two years, um, their Christian's dad, the, the husband and father of this family, showed up. It's a long story why he couldn't be there in the beginning. It goes back to the persecutions that they were fleeing from. But I was there at O'Hare Airport as he met his two-year-old daughter for the first time. As he embraced his son Christian, who'd probably grown about a foot in those years. And they were all holding it together quite well, and I was just like a weepy, emotional mess off in the corner of the baggage claim. Like, I couldn't quite hold it together. But it was powerful. And with time, he became just a really dear friend as well. In some ways, uh, he and his wife became mentors to Diana and me in marriage. We'd probably been married about a year at that point. At one point, they were over for dinner, and they asked us a question, which, by the way, is not culturally appropriate, but we'll forgive that because they're not from here. They said, so you guys have been married for a while now. When are you going to have a baby? And Diana and I kind of looked at each other a little sheepishly. You know, did we want to talk about this? The reality is, since we'd been married, we'd hoped and prayed to have a baby. We'd both always imagined being parents at some point. And it hadn't happened. And we were starting to wonder if maybe that wasn't going to happen. So we shared that. We said, which is you know, a very nice, casual, suburban Christian thing to say, we said, we'd really love for you to pray for us. And they assured us they would. In fact, John Vieira said, I just have this sense from the Lord that he's going to bless you with a child in the next year. Oh, we smiled and thanked him. That was really sweet. Um, but frankly, I didn't start painting the nursery because it's not like we hadn't tried prayer. But it was only a few months later, this time we were over at their house for dinner, and we got to share with them the good news that Diana was pregnant. And I will never forget the moment, there was kind of a few seconds of delay as they're, you know, they're still learning English, they're processing what we were saying into their own language in their minds. We could see that they had understood what we just told them. And their faces lit up and actually they literally fell down on the ground prostrate in their kitchen. I don't know exactly what they were saying, but there was a lot of shouts of Jesus and hallelujahs. It was like a Pentecostal church service right there in their kitchen. <laughs> and they went on to tell us that they'd been getting up early every Thursday. They'd been praying and fasting all day every Thursday that God would bless us with a child. And you can see on the screen my daughter Zipporah with her godparents, jean V and Marie. And she is, I have no doubt, the answer to their prayers. And to ours, but mostly to theirs, because I didn't fast and pray all day on Thursdays. <laughs> so I'll close with that challenge, to practice hospitality. Practice loving strangers. Don't be surprised if some of them turn into family, or if you find out that some of them have been angels in disguise. Thanks.